started last week, just started this, this teaching here in Colossians. How are we measuring up to what Paul presents to the Colossians? And we're going to just do a little bit of review and then pick up right at verse 6, take it down to verse 12 today. So I'll tell you what, let's start at verse 1, take it down to verse 12 in the opening reading. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world. Also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you. Also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, today there are two issues Paul brings up that are a little, uh, that can be a little unsettling for today's average Christian. But, you know, we will boldly go where none of those men have gone before and uh, continue down that route because that's how it is with me. But let me give you just a little bit of background here, a little bit of review from last week. Remember, one of the first things that Paul wanted us to give our attention to had to do with how we measure up relative to the fact that, look at the authors here, look at those who are receiving this text. We find out that uh, how many people are writing to the Colossians? How many are writing? How many authors? Two. Two. There you go, Paul and Timothy. Where do you get that answer from? Verse one. Oh, verse 1. See, we get all of our stuff from the text. All right, so we always hear people say, well, Paul wrote the Colossians. Well, so did Timothy. Timothy was part of this. Now, we don't know at what point Paul may have sort of put down the pen and Timothy would have picked it up. We're not sure. But in any case, these are a part of the Holy Spirit's thoughts through Paul and Timothy as well. So we went through that. And then in verse 2, we talked about these saints and faithful brethren who are at Christ. Not two categories of individuals, but one category. Because what we've got here in the word and is chi, the Greek word, which is an explanative conjunction. And that's important because it explains what is being said before. Who are these saints? Well, they are the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. And then verse 3, he begins to get, get into it a little further relative to who he's giving thanks to. Uh, for the Colossians in particular. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we entered in to the, to, uh, the aspects of the difference between the ontological view of the Trinity that the Bible speaks of and the economic view of the Trinity. And those are important things. Uh, I, I stress more and more uh, as time goes on the explanation of notice that this is a Trinitarian verse. Notice that this is a, an ontological uh, aspect of the Trinity as opposed to an economic view. Because we stress that because if you don't understand who the Godhead is, who it is that saves you, that there is no salvation. You have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ came to present us knowledge of the Father. Remember John, the first chapter, and I believe it's the 14th verse, talks about the fact that he came to open up and exegete for us 
who God the Father was. It is through Christ that we find out who the Father was. He is going to be called and referred to as the invisible God here in Colossians. The invisible God, which we will deal with in detail. And it is only Christ that we know who God the Father is. So, when you see a phrase that says like it does right here in verse 3, we give thanks to God the Father. It is designating who he is and, uh, let's just put it this way, how he behaves, if you will, within the Godhead. Remember, God the Father is not the CEO of the Godhead boardroom or anything like that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all equally God. We believe, because the Bible teaches, that God is tripersonal. God is tripersonal, but he is one in being. One in being. Now that's the ontological aspect. Ontos, the Greek word, being, means being. How he exists, how the sun exists, how the spirit exists. They all exist as co-eternal, co-divine, co-substantial. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean God the Father has a body. Co-substantial is a theological term uh, that has to do with the substances of the facts of the Godhead, not that he is that he is physical. And that all three are considered God, and that Godhead is expressed tri-personally. Tri-personally. So it's important to understand the difference, and we'll just keep going with this as it comes up, the difference between God and his being and the personality of God. Tri-personal, but one in being. That's why Jesus is going to later say, which we've already seen in our, our teaching in, uh, in John's Gospel, the 10th chapter, where he says in verse 33, I believe it is, that I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Or uh, in uh, John the 17th chapter, where he prays to the Father. He says, restore unto me the glory that I had with you. That's crazy. Come on. The glory. Here's a man. The perfect man. The glory that I had with you before the world was. So they are co-eternal. They are co-divine. That has to do with the personality of the Godhead. It has to do with uh, the uh, ontological view of the Godhead. Because they share the same being and they express themselves tri-personally. The big uh, mistake that is out there and has been out there for for a long time, it is manifest through the United Pentecostal Church, for instance, today, is that is, is a form of modalism when it comes to the Godhead. Modalism just means that God uh, shows himself through different modes. You know what a mode is. Okay, through different modes. And so at one time in the Old Testament, he expresses himself as God the Father. And then you get into the New Testament, he expresses himself as God the Son, and then the Son ascends, and then God expresses himself as? The yeah, the Holy Spirit. So, at one point in history, he's the Father. At one point in history, he's the Son. At one point in history, he is the Spirit. That's wrong. That, that, doesn't come up, that doesn't compute biblically at all. So, it's not modalism. Uh, that's, that's incorrect. Uh, it is God who is one in being, but he is three in personality. That's how the, the New Testament expresses all of this. And of course in the past I've done some more detailed uh, Trinitarian things for you. But that is really, really critical to know who is doing what at what time. See, the Father does not die on the cross. No, 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 no. Jesus is not the Father. Jesus dies on the cross as the second personality of the Godhead. But the Father is, is not dying on the cross. Patropassianism is the theological and historical word for that. that. That is incorrect. Let's keep going here. So he's giving thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By placing God as the Father, he is also talking uh, and, is, and speaking to us about the submission of Christ to the Father. And uh, we've seen passages that speak about the eternal sonship of the Son. God sent His only begotten. Son. Yeah, He didn't send somebody who was not the Son, who then became the Son. He always was the Son, and it was the Son who was sent by the Father. 
So whenever you see passages that are, that are saying that, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you want to think in those kind of terms. And you'll get used to it. I know that's a lot to, to chew and swallow and that kind of a thing, but you get used to it. Now, as he is giving thanks to God the Father, it says at the end of verse 3 that he is praying always for them. So notice that the aspects of prayer to God the Father, and that's what Jesus has done for us. He has enabled us through his sacrifice on the cross and the resurrection, giving us the gifts of faith and repentance. He enables us now to do what we just got through doing while we were being led by Pastor Brian. And that is coming boldly before the throne of grace that we might seek and receive help in the time of need. Make our requests known, you see. That comes through the submissive work of the Son to the Father. The Father is now satisfied with the uh, sacrifice, the propitiation, the substitutionary work of God, of the Son on the cross. He is satisfied with that. And now, because Jesus is our acceptable sacrifice and our substitute, we can now come before him. And one of the things that Paul wants us to know is that he is praying always for them, the Colossians. And I asked you a question last week. I said, do you How's your prayer life? Just for us guys here at Messiah. You know, it's just, it's just an incredible uh, privilege. Verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. So faith and love. We talked about that last week. I won't repeat it now. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth the gospel. Now. We're getting into verse 6, and this will be starting the teaching for today. Getting into verse 6, you want to hold on to the last statement that he makes in verse 6, in order, or verse 5, excuse me, in order for you to understand verse 6. So at the bottom of verse 5, they previously heard in the word of truth, which is the gospel. The gospel, now 6, which has come to you? Question for you. What has come to them? Gospel. The gospel, okay. And we get that from watching the context of verse 5 and then bang, right into which has come to you. All right, now, how has this gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, yes? Maybe? Not sure? For, yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 says, This is Paul says, This is the gospel. It was given to me. I have given it to you that Christ Jesus die, or died on the cross according to the scriptures. He was raised from the dead, so on and so forth. And he talks about the fact that this is the gospel. And he names it. Which has come to you just as in all the world, also as it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The gospel has now come into all the world. Let me ask you a question. At this time in history, about the early 50s, which is when, 50 to 60, which is when this epistle was written, did the gospel make it down to South Africa? Was the gospel present uh, far off in the northern uh, reaches of what we know today as, as Russia? How about all the way down to what we call Australia today? What about North America or South America? No, 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 no. That's not what is meant by world in the New Testament. Not as what is meant by world. Now the Greek word here, as you look at it in verse 6, the Greek word for world is cosmos. Cosmos. Now that's that word that depending upon your context will have different types of, of uh, definitions. Uh, here it's speaking about the people of the world because he's not interested in preaching the gospel to a rock, although there are some churches out there, you might as well be talking to a rock because they're not really paying attention. But here, you've got just as it is in all the world. So the gospel has come to the Colossians that it has in all the world. Let me give you another verse. Down in verse 23 of this same chapter. Verse 23, take a look. He speaks about the fact that Christ... In 22, has reconciled us through the fleshly body, through his death, uh, presenting us before him holy, blameless, beyond reproach, reproach. 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, t pistai, t, definite article, faith, pistai, the faith, firmly established, steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. Now here we go, watch this 
which was proclaimed. Where? In all creation under heaven. Now that phrase under heaven specifies for us what he means by creation. See, Because sometimes, uh, sometimes the Greek word for creation can be referring to us as 2 Corinthians 5.17. New creations in who? Christ. Christ. But we're called a new creation. And that's referred to in several other places where people are referred to as the kitesis, the Greek word, kitesis, or creation of God. We get that also in Romans 8, which is also not talking about the physical creation. It's talking about people. It's talking about the regenerate creation right there. Uh, another text for another time. I've given it to you once before, but in any case, in verse 23, it says that this gospel was proclaimed in all creation. So between, uh, between AD 50 and 60, and I think AD 60 is a little bit of a stretch uh, for the penning of the authorship of, of Colossians, but let's say 50, maybe mid-50, 50, 55, something like that, the gospel has already done what? It's already gone through all of creation. It's already gone. Remember the phrase under heaven? Remember that continuous phrase, uh, uh, under heaven, that's used in Ecclesiastes? Under heaven, under heaven, under heaven. That's the Jewish phrase uh, for that which is um, uh, human, in this case. Uh, it's man, mankind. Okay. Uh, so, this gospel has gone out to all the world. To all the world. What the heck does that mean? That means that we've got a fulfillment passage taking place right here. And I know most of you, or some of you at least, are aware of some of this fulfillment passage. Meet me over in uh, the Olivet Discourse now of Matthew, and verse tw uh, chapter 24, and verse 14. Matthew 24, and verse 14. Now remember, Paul just got through saying, in two spots, and that's just Colossians, that the gospel had already gone out to every creation, every creature, excuse me, throughout the entire world. What world would that be? The only world that they knew, Roman Empire, exactly right. Now watch out, some important stuff is coming. Look at how, as Jesus begins to prophesy about the end of the Old Covenant and the casting down and the destruction of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, picture of that Old Covenant, which is, of course, the temple and all that went on in regards to the Old Testament, sacrificial system and whatnot. They asked the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, four of the apostles do, as he is coming out of the temple, he's already said uh, at the end of chapter 23 that this temple is going down. And so the disciples come up to him in verse 1 as he's walking away from the temple and heading up the side of the Mount of Olives. Disciples come up to him to point out the buildings to him. And in, in Mark's gospel, it, and in Luke 2, I believe, but Mark's for sure, uh, he, they start telling him, look at the beauty. Look at all that is... The idea is that, you mean this is all going to go away? Because in Judaism, first century Judaism, the temple was everything. Temple was everything. It expressed everything in regards to their religion and their faith. And so the boys are saying, but it's so beautiful. Look at this. You're saying all this is going to be thrown down. Verse 2, and he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here. Stone of what? Temple. A temple, sure, that's your context. Will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So then he takes his seat on the Mount of Olives in verse 3. Now watch this. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us two questions now. Tell us two things. Number one, when will these things happen? Which he does. He keeps saying to them, it's going to happen in your generation. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? What will be the sign of the coming? He's already expressed the sign of his coming. Uh, earlier at the end of chapter 23. But he's going to do it again here. The sign of his parousia is the destruction of the temple. That's very important. I, I don't want to take a lot of time with it right now because it's not, it's not dealing with a lot of Colossians. But I do want to give you some of this context right here. What I really want you to see is the end of verse 3. The sign of your coming and secondly, the centulias to eonas. Centulias, completion, Aeonas of the age. 
genitive in the noun form. The completion of the age, or you could translate it as the end of the age. My New American Standard says end of the age, so does yours. What would be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? End of the age. Now look at 14. Just want to show you one thing. 14. He says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. The word here for world is oikomene. That's the direct lexical first reference definition for the Roman Empire in the New Testament era of the first century. The gospel, once it is preached in all the world, once it has reached all the oikomene throughout the Roman Empire, then the end will come. What end? Give me a verse. End of the age. Verse... Three, what we were just looking at. The end of verse three. Look at it again. Three, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Centulias eonas. The end. That's the end that he's talking about. That's the context. It hasn't changed yet. So when you look at 14, the gospel goes out and gets preached in all the world as a testimony to all the nations. Then the end will come. Then the end of the age will come. Uh, leave Matthew and slip over to Romans, the first chapter. Romans, the first chapter, and look at verse 8. Because uh, that Colossians passage is not the only place, Colossians 1.6, Colossians 1.23, is not the only place uh, where the apostolic and gospel writers uh, spoke about this end having to do with the gospel going in to all of the world. He says in Romans 1.8, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed where? Throughout the whole world. So it's already in process of being proclaimed throughout the entire world. Look at the last chapter of Romans. 16th chapter now. Romans 16. In verses 25 and 26, watch this. In Romans 16, 25 and 26, Paul says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith. Oh my goodness. How about 1 Timothy 3.16? 1 Timothy 3.16. See, this is not a foreign concept. 1 Timothy 3.16. In the midst of this confession, part of the first century confession during the 50s, and this, 1 Timothy was written pushing towards mid to late 50s. So one of the confessions of the church in the first century is right here. Now watch one of these items that are confessed. 1 Timothy 3.16, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, uh-oh, proclaimed, past tense now, among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus' prophecy about the gospel going out to all the oikomeni, all the world, these apostolic writers, Paul in particular, is, is saying has already taken place. That has been fulfilled. Now we're looking for the end to come. Um, slip over to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Then we'll get back on over to Colossians. This is, listen to what Paul says to the first century Colossians. 
another early 50s epistle. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he's speaking about what he just uh, spoke to them about, the idolatry of Israel and the immorality, this kind of a thing. Now, verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, watch it, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Let's read it again. These things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction. Upon whom, us, that means in the first century, our instruction, upon whom, refers back to our, the ends of the ages have arrived. The Greek word is katantao. Come is okay, but arrived is better. Katantao, upon whom the ends of the ages has arrived. Okay, I, I didn't speak truth to you. I'm taking you back to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, and we're looking at 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You know what this is. 18, Jesus says to the boys, Judas is not there, he's dead. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. There's your target making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The result of making disciples is the one baptism that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4 or 5. Now watch 20. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now this is in regards to the apostolic preaching job that he gave the apostles. It doesn't mean he's not with them after that, because watch what it says. Greek is a little sharper, of course. To observe all that I command you, middle of 20, lo, I am with you, that's umon, there's your pronoun, your plural pronoun, I am with all of you, and then it says posas tas imeras. Posas tas imeras means uh, all the days. All the days. I don't know why. Days is not in here. But okay. Um, I am with you. Posastasimeras. All the days. Even is not in the Greek text. Until or to the. You're going to love this. End of the age. Centulias deonas. It's the same thing. That he spoke about earlier in Matthew. So I could take you to two more spots. Where he uses the phrase. Centulias deonas. Aeonas, to the completion of the age. The writer of the Hebrews uses that phrase uh, as well in uh, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Okay, having said all that, back to Colossians. Back to Colossians. So, in verse 6, this gospel had come to them just as in all the world. In other words, it already had come into all the world, and you've got all these other passages that verify that. And if that is the case, then that means the end of the ages, 1 Corinthians 10 11, had katantao, had arrived, had come upon those living in the in the first century. The end of the age. It's the same thing as Matthew. 24:14 that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached unto all the nations go out into all the world and then the end will come in other words that end refers back to Matthew 24:3 the suntelios to aeonas the question that the disciples asked Jesus what will be the sign of your coming parousia and the end of the age what would be the end of the age? And the end of the age is in reference to the Mosaic Age, the Mosaic Age of Law, the Mosaic Age of the Temple, and all that went on in regards uh, to that. They had come to that then, and that has everything to do with the parousia. But I, want to, I emphasize that strongly because uh, this is an important passage that gets, looked, gets overlooked. It gets overlooked a lot. Verse 6 right here. Just as in all the world. I mean, be honest, you know, when you're starting off in, a, in, a, uh, in an epistle and the first few verses, you kind of go past these things. So it has come in all the world, go on now, as it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing ever as it has been doing in you. That's fabulous. 
Also, since the day you heard of it, heard of the gospel, and understood the grace of God in truth. You heard it and you understood it. You heard it and you understood it. That means... That means uh, regeneration had already taken place inside of them because 1 Corinthians 2.14, you should be able to say this to me, the natural man, the unregenerate man, cannot, cannot, cannot receive of the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto them and so on. All right. Now look at this. Even it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now the reason they were not just able to uh, hear it, hear the gospel, but to understand it, to understand it is because someone who was stopping them from understanding it during the first century had been bound. Had been bound. Uh, check out Matthew 12 with me. 12th chapter of Matthew, starting at verse 26. Matthew 12, verses 26 through 29, actually. The Pharisees had already blasphemed, committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had, saying Jesus' power to cast out was by Beelzebul. Beelzebul. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, speaks to them in 25, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So Satan had a kingdom. If I by Beelzebul, another word for Satan, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the kingdom of God was already manifest in the first century with the presence of Christ. Now 29. Or, now here's my question. How did the gospel get out and be understood and have the uh, and have the impact and the effect that it had in the first century. It was about 20, 25 years tops, and the gospel had made it throughout the Roman Empire. Throughout the Roman Empire. That's wild. It's a lot of bodies. It's a lot of people. That's a lot of traveling. How did it happen? What was stopping it? What was holding it back that had to be dealt with? 29. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house, your context is, is, is this study of Satan here, the strong man's house, that's Satan, and carry off his property, it's another way of saying delivering people from demonism, unless he first, what? Ooh, binds the strong man, then he will plunder his house. Jesus' ministry, loosing, 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 one uh, elect after the next after the next in the first century. But what had to happen in order for this to happen in the speed that it did throughout the Roman Empire beginning with uh, the teaching and the ministry of Jesus all the way through, uh, just about all the way through the, the disciples themselves. What had to happen? Well the strong man had to be bound. Strong man had to be bound. And the book of Revelation speaks to this. The book of Revelation talks about how in its historicity, I'm going to take you to Revelation 20, 20 now, Revelation 20, how in Revelation in its historicity speaks to and points to the fact that this was in fact done. Revelation 20 actually points back to what I just read to you in Matthew 12, 29. Revelation chapter 20 and the first three verses. Revelation chapter 20 in the first three verses. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Remember now, ladies and gentlemen, those two bookend passages. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, Revelation 22.6. Both speak the same thing. That everything contained, not including the, the letters, chapter 2 and 3, but everything that was contained within that revelation was to quickly, soon, at hand, come to pass. Not three, two, three thousand, four thousand years later. That's ridiculous. English language and all communication ceases at that point. That's why people are so confused when it comes to eschatology. Isn't it interesting how, how uh, we allow in the church two, three, four, five 
different views of eschatology, not only the coming of Christ, but the millennium and things like that. That's allowed. That's okay. You know, but it certainly is not okay to have two or three different views of the person of the Holy Spirit, the person of Christ, the doctrine of justification by faith, and that kind of a thing. That is not okay. You know why that's not okay? Because throughout the history of the church with the various councils and synods, the church had come to a conclusion about the meanings of those things. And they've covered it all except for eschatology, which is what you've heard me say before. There has never been a synod or a council that has met together concerning the subject of eschatology to nail this thing down. That's why there's all this loosey-goosey stuff out there. Do you think that glorifies God? I don't. The word means one thing relative to each thing that it talks about. It doesn't. It, this is not. This is not spiritual smorgasbord. <laughs> Revelation twenty verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Remember, all these things are signified to us. Revelation one one. This angel is, is Christ, which constantly is getting proved as we are going through Revelation on Wednesday nights. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key authority of the abyss, the abuso, and a great chain is in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and what? Bound him for kelia ete. Thousand years. Thousands of years. <laughs> the plurals are wild. I'm not getting into it right now. Bound him for a thousand years. What for? What did he bind him for? Well, it's told us in verse 3. And threw him into the abyss, shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he would not, what? Deceive the nations any longer until the Kalia Ete were completed. Remember, literalism relative to the, the Greek gematric or the Hebrew gematric system is not to be found in the book of Revelation. Literalism goes out the window. This numbering system has a meaning all unto itself, which we've been discovering on Wednesday nights, and it has nothing to do with a literal thousand years coming to pass, that's premillennialism. That's Schofieldism. That's Horror Story 501. The whole purpose of the, of the binding was to stop Satan, middle of three, from deceiving the nations any longer. For what? For what? So that the gospel could go out into all the world. Gathering God's elect unto himself. So that then, Matthew 24, verse 14, the end could come. Back to Colossians. This has taken entirely too long. I'm going to take the next two weeks off and not study anymore until we get all of this done. I've got too much stuff here. Verse 7. Just as you learned it, e mathete, just as you learned it, this is part of the word for a disciple, from Epaphras, learn the gospel, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. Now, it's a possibility that Epaphras may have been the one that brought the gospel the first time to these Colossians, because they heard it from him. Uh, look over at chapter 4 and verse 12. Chapter 4 and verse 12. As Paul winds up the epistle, he makes another reference to Epaphras. He says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, church membership, we might call it that, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. I have to uh, confess to you that that is not my prayer practice and I need help. I need to make uh, better strides and follow the example of Epaphras a little bit more. He says he is always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. Why? 
Sometimes we don't know how or what we should pray for our brothers and sisters. Well, how about this? That they may stand perfect. Stand perfect and also fully assured in all the will of God. That's Epaphras. That's the guy that first brought the gospel to the Colossians. Might have been the founder of the church right there. In verse 7. Look at verse 8. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. That phrase, love in the Spirit, simply means it's a love that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. A love that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so, and so he has informed us now of your love in the Spirit. You know, this is making Paul's heart just flame. This is great. As opposed to the Galatians or something like that, which he has to say to them in the fourth chapter because chapter, they're falling away. They're apostatizing. He says, I fear I've wasted my time with you, you Galatians, right? Or when he's writing to the Corinthians and you know all about them, we just finished, I don't know how long, dealing with them in regards to uh, the hurt that they caused the Apostle Paul in regards to the sin and the flesh work that was constantly uh, going on right there. But Epaphras brought a good message. Love in the Spirit or love controlled by the Spirit. All right, C love controlled by the Spirit. This is a love that's going to be in keeping with the Holy Spirit's inspired directions concerning love that you only find here in the Word of God. So it's a love that is controlled by the Spirit that is that we get at where, wherein the Word of God we find our education in regards to that love in particular. The, the, rather than me going through, because I'm it take too long, going through all the expressions, the various expressions of love now that one is in Christ and the love that one expresses, we start with in the in the New Testament a love that is self-sacrificial. It's always a reference to agape. Agape. It is the self-sacrificial love. It is the love that the Father has for His church. That sends Christ is only to the cross. Agape. The giving up of one's self. See, this is a love that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Himself, when He was discussing that love with the Father uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, was saying, not my will, but thine be done. Could you take this cup away from me? Let this cup be taken away from me. Ah, but not my will, but yours be done. That is love controlled by the Spirit. When you know that you are being led by the will of God, which is taught us here in the Scripture, not through, you know, having some vision or something like that, but, but that which the... Word of the Holy Word of God uh, provides, when that is being provided to you and the will of God is, is taking place through you and you can express that by pointing to passages of Scripture that speak on that subject, you know that you are being controlled by the Holy Spirit. When you, uh, you would rather not do something for someone else, but you know it's the right thing and you ask the Lord, Lord, please forgive me for that attitude that I just expressed to you. You heard it. You saw it. You know what happened just now. That's love. And then you turn around and do it. That's love controlled by the Spirit. Love that is controlled by the Spirit matures into a love where I want those things. That once upon a time, I didn't want to do it all. I didn't want to do it for them, for her, for him, whatever. But then you begin to see, no, this is, this is who God has made me to be. This is con being conformed to the image of Christ. Part of being conformed to the image of Christ is love controlled by the Spirit. This is why Paul points this out. I mean, he probably could have pointed other things out to them that Epaphras had no informed Paul of, but this one, this one headline, this is above the fold, if you will. Which brings us then to verse 9. Love in the Spirit, control by for also, since the Spirit, we have not ceased to pray for you. 
and to ask you, to ask, excuse me, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. There's his will again in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now look at the middle right here. We have not ceased to pray for you. So love controlled by the Spirit will drive to will drive you to spend more time all the time. See? That doesn't mean every minute of every second of every day, but that there is a regular discipline in your life where whether you are in the car, at the job, whether you are at church, having dinner with the family, there are opportunities the Holy Spirit calls us to whereby we intercede, we move into intercede, intercession by the direction of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's of course, that, aspects, uh, that aspect of Romans the 8th chapter. What is that, the 20, 26th verse, I believe? Romans 8, I'm going to it. And verse 26, actually, you should probably back it up to verse 24. Romans 8, 24. For in, the hope, in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it in the same way. Waiting eagerly for it. The Spirit the Holy Spirit, also helps us or assists our weaknesses. What's my weakness? Well, I not only don't always know how to pray, but getting me to pray. There's a weakness. Getting me to pray. For we do not know how to pray as we should. So we should know how to pray, he says. It's a roundabout way of saying we should know how to pray. Now he's addressing the Romans, who had had enough teaching and enough time uh, in the Word and maturing in the things of Christ, that they should know how to pray. But guess what? There are legitimate times where you just don't know. There are times you just don't know. And this is legitimate right here. And I, I default to this on many occasions. And I recommend you have this as your prayer default too. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Uh, alaletois. Alaletois. It just means without words. Too deep for words, that's, uh, that's a paraphrase, but the literal is without words. So the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings without words. So much for the Pentecostals and the Charismatics using this for tongues. And he who searches the hearts, because it's without words, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. He who searches the hearts is the Father here. So what do we have going on right here? Make me happy. Oh, oh, that was wonderful the way you guys just spit that out. Yeah, the Trinity. You've got an aspect of the Trinity. What kind? Uh, make me even happier. Is it ontological or is it economic? He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. You bet, you bet. You heard your dad say that. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. What does economic mean? Never mind. I'll let it go. <laughs> it's the way that the, uh, that the members of the Godhead behave within the Godhead. He who searches, the Father, the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because He intercedes, that's the Spirit, it has to go back to its nearest antecedent. He goes back to Spirit here. Okay, so he, the Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to God or will of God is, is accurate as, as well. And guess what? That's why verse 28 works. That's why verse 28 works. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Because, uh, be honest with, you, with me now, how often does that get quoted? Completely missing a context. And it's applied to all kinds of stuff. Well, all things work together. You know, I got this flat tire, you know, I broke down over here. Well, praise the Lord, all things work together. <laughs> what? No. What works together for good is the fact that the Holy Spirit inter intercedes for us according to the will of God. So back to Colossians. 
And the middle of verse 9, when he says, we have not ceased to pray for you. Pao, ceased. Pao in Greek. We have not stopped, slammed on the brakes to pray for you, to ask that you may be. Now he's got specific content right here. Specific content. To ask that you be, number one, filled with the knowledge of his will. What is the knowledge of his will? It's expressed in scripture. It's expressed in scripture. That's the only way you can get the knowledge uh, of his will. Like uh, Ephesians 5.17. That was a tongue, by the way. Uh, like that? Yep. Ephesians 5.17. Watch this now. Uh, context. I'm going to go back to 15, Ephesians 5, 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, or live, peripatao, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, so then, in light of what I just said in 15 and 16, so then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord has been expressed here. How do we know what the will of the Lord is? Very good. They tell us how to walk in verse 15, right? Be careful how you walk, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. That's the will of the Lord. Don't be a spiritual dope, in other words. 16. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is the will of the Lord, according to verse 15, that I walk as wise, not as unwise. It is the will of the Lord that I watch my time. Take care of the time God's given me, because the days are evil. That's the will of the Lord. I need to watch out for that. And then he expresses in verse 18, more of the will of the Lord. Don't get drunk with wine. It's dissipation. It's... Uh, um, asotia is salvation less. It's salvation less. Asotia. Reckless also. It could be translated as, as reckless and so on and so forth. Um, what else on the will of the Lord? Uh, how about 1 Thessalonians 5.18? 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, simple, simple. It says in everything, in most things, right? No, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Back to Colossians. So with those things in mind, with those things in mind, I am to ask, or Paul is asking, that the Colossians be filled with the knowledge of his will. There are some examples of the knowledge of his will. But that they are in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Spiritual is the qualifier as opposed to earthly wisdom. Earthly, fleshly wisdom. That which is born of men and men's thinking. We're not to pray in accordance with that, but in accordance with God's understanding of these things. Verse 10, so that you will walk, peripatao, live, behave, that you will walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. That is, that word there for worthy is akios. Um, it means that which has weight. Weight. W -H W, excuse me. Good, I don't have to spell it. You already know. <laughs> Not W-A-I-T. Glad you guys are faster than me. So that you will walk or live in a manner that is weight. A life that carries weight with God. A life that carries weight with God uh, lives out verse 9. It doesn't cease to pray. And the types of prayers are not only the Romans 8 stuff I was giving you, but right here, fill, being filled with the knowledge of His will, which we get through the Scriptures. I don't know how to pray. Pray is tough for me. One of the first things I tell people is you need to do a study on prayer. Simple. Just get your concordance out. Look up pray, prayer, uh, 
prayers, l look them all up, start to categorize them in regards to, to topics, you know, categories on a sheet of, sheet of paper and that kind of, write them all down and that will begin to give you an idea of how God wants you to pray. These will be effectual prayers that will get what you are asking from God because you're praying in accordance with His will. Praying in accordance with His will. There doesn't have to be any guesswork in regards to prayer and how to receive from God. You know, Jesus, Matthew 7, keep on asking, because they're all present tense uh, verbs, uh, ask, keep on asking and you will receive, right? Seek and you will find, keep seeking and you'll find. Keep knocking, and the door will be open unto you. He who, and then he goes on, right? So that is so, that is so great to me. You just say, I, I just think we take that for, uh, just uh, for granted so much when it comes to prayer. God actually says, ask, I'll give it to you. Right? Because if you're praying that asking in accordance with what the scripture says, I kid you not, take your concordance, look up the word prayer, pray, pray, all of its, all of its, uh, uh, all of its uh, concomitants, look all that stuff up, write it down in categories, with each category as a theme or a subject or a topic, begin to commit those things to, to, your, to your memory, and then you'll begin to have categories of prayer within your heart, within your mind. And so when you go to pray, you will not actually have to be, listen, you won't have to be depending upon the Holy Spirit to fill in the blanks, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Those blanks don't have to be filled in. Now, I'm not dissing, <laughs> The prayer of the Holy Spirit or the intercession of the Holy Spirit. But remember, what he gives us there in Romans 8, 26 and 27 is if we don't know how to pray, what does it say next? As we should. That's kind of a slight mild rebuke. As we should. We should know how, but we don't often do know how. I think that's a good place to put the comma. We'll comma it right there. Lots and lots of good stuff here in Colossians. I had something I was going to show you. I was going to take you all the way back to Genesis to show it to you. You're going to have to wait for that one. Can you wait? Can you wait? You can't wait, sis? Okay, you stay afterwards. Okay. okay. Hey, y'all, sermon number two. That means all you guys won't get it because I'm not repeating it. It's on you on YouTube. Oh, oh, no. We're shutting that off. Lord, we just love you and praise you and thank you for all that you have been showing us, O oh God, in thy word. How great is your truth to us. Thank you for regenerating us so we're no longer natural men and we can't receive of the things of the Spirit of God. Rather, Lord, we can receive of those things. Thank you, thank you so, so much, Lord, for the presence of thy Holy Spirit inside, Lord God, uh, of these softened hearts, Lord. No longer like like it says in Ezekiel uh, 30, 36, 26, do we have hearts of stone, but rather you've given us that heart of flesh, that softening, that other way of speaking to us about regeneration. So we might know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We praise and worship and thank you uh, for these things today, O oh Lord God. And now, Lord, as we, as we begin to close down the service, uh, we begin to ask, Lord, that your blessing would be upon your people as uh, they have uh, determined with you of what they uh, should give, Lord God. I just thank you for the freedom that we have, that you have given us in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, for instance. Lord, that freedom to give in accordance with uh, what we have not to give under some pressure situation in regards to what we don't have, but rather, Lord God, it's between you and us. And so now, Lord, as the people give, let them just bless them, Lord God. Bless their finances. Uh, bless their mindsets. Let it be filled with thinking of thy word, thinking of Christ. Bless them with health in their bodies, Lord, and in their spirits. Raise up, Lord God, uh, your health within us, spiritual, emotional, 
emotional, financial, physical health, Lord God, that you would be seen in us. And Lord, as we've talked so much about prayer today, Lord God, make us stronger, more definite prayers in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, we just seek to please you uh, with our giving right now. Thank you, Lord God, to be able to do that together. In Jesus' name, amen.